It's James Langford just finished up um, about 45 minutes ago, I guess now I'm a little bit late running, uh, running over from the Senate chamber when we wrapped up everything from the impeachment hearings tonight. Uh, we've now started into a new week. Uh, this is the second day for the White House team to be able to present their case. Uh, we had an opening arguments where it went 13 hours, our, our opening debate there, I should say, on the rules. We had three days uh, that the House managers presented their case, and now we're in the second day of the White House presenting their case. A lot of different people spoke today uh, to be able to represent the White House and went through a bunch of different arguments. Ken Starr was the first major speaker that they had. Obviously, Ken Starr was the, the one who was the special counsel that was in the uh, impeachment for Bill Clinton. Uh, that was about a four and a half year process that he was on a task gathering information, doing the background information, and that led towards the impeachment of Bill Clinton. He was talking through all the details, the history uh, that time period and spent a lot of time really going through all that uh, all the different issues that he had, uh, which was a pretty remarkable conversation just to be able to get the context. But he also went through a bunch of history. One of the comments that he made that I thought was really interesting is he identified impeachment has a really high standard uh, for conviction. Uh, there's been 63 different individuals impeached by the House of Representatives. Most of those by far were judges uh, because the vast majority of impeachments that happen are actually judges, not executive branch, obviously. But he said in the history of the United States, there have been 63 impeachments but the Senate has only convicted eight of those total. Uh, so there's such a high bar for conviction. There's a lower bar for impeachment, but a much higher bar for conviction. He kind of walked through some of that process as well, uh, what that really looks like and gave a lot of the history as we walked through uh, the details there. Then it shifted over into the major arguments that were made by the House Democrats and to be able to walk through some of those. The Article 1 on abuse of power, Article 2 on obstruction of Congress. They spent some time also talking about due process and what that looked like in the House of Representatives. And they walked back through some of the things that they had mentioned a little bit on the first day on Saturday and spent more time with. For instance, the White House visit. They said there's really two issues that the House keeps bringing up and say these are the items of value, quote unquote, that the president was saying quid pro quo to be able to get. They started with the issue about the White House visit and said, here's how plain this really is, that President Zelensky in the call itself on the 25th of July said, uh, hey, if we can't meet at the White House and can't work that out quick, we're both going to be in Poland on September the 1st. So let's just meet in Poland on September the 1st. And they responded positively to that, and the White House began the process of setting that meeting up for September the 1st. And this was way back in July and into August as well. So early on, they started doing the details to be able to set that meeting up. Now, as the meeting gets close to it on September the 1st, Hurricane Dorian is coming at the United States. And the president literally in the final moments of that, before he's getting ready to leave for Poland, makes the decision, I'm going to stay here in the United States because Hurricane Dorian is here to be able to oversee all, all that FEMA work. And he sends the vice president in his place. All the security has already been done. The vice president goes to Poland. The vice president meets with President Zelensky, and he brings the report back. Uh, so again, th this whole adage that the president was putting off a White House meeting, they, they immediately obliterated that and said, no, that's not true. President Zelensky is the one that brought up the meeting in September the 1st, and that was actually in process and would have occurred, except for Hurricane Dorian. Then that was reset then for September the 25th, the next time they were both together, and that was at the UN meeting uh, in uh, New York. So that was the one big piece. They said, okay, clearly that's not a quid pro quo because they were already in process of settling this. That wasn't slowed down at all. The second one dealt with uh, the issue about the security assistance. And they spent a lot of time talking about how the security assistance came, what happened with it, all the process, where the rumors came from and different things on it. And then they spent some time talking about the two key questions on that. Why was the funding slowed down? The Department of Defense had certified uh, in May, uh, early June, that time period, had certified and said it's ready to go. But it was stalled at that point and it's been unanswered at this point until today. And they spent a lot of time talking about the different meetings they had within the White House about wondering about what's happening in the transitions in Ukraine. Remember, there was an election in May where a new president comes on board. That new president's brand new. State Department was concerned about the new president uh, coming on board, and they had lots of questions on his initial hires. So there's a pause there. Then the new president calls for new elections uh, in uh, Ukraine and does snap elections and is going to take out all of parliament. Again, they don't know what's really happening. This is a brand new person, never been in elected office, untested in this dissolves parliament and is now going to totally transition parliament that happens in july in fact that's why the july the 25th call happens is because that new parliament was just elected and it was overwhelmingly in president Zelensky's favor from his party 
And then it starts up from there to be able to say, what's the new parliament going to do? And so there's several months of that. Multiple conversations are happening behind the scenes. One of the witnesses that was actually uh, one of the House witnesses, they uh, played a clip, the White House manager or the White House counsel played a clip of something that came from the House testimony that the House did not play before. Uh, and that was Tim Morrison, who's one of the lead people behind the scenes and coordinating everything with State Department from overseas back to the president was saying they were constantly gathering information about burden sharing. They were gathering information about corruption and they were gathering a file and sending it directly to the White House to be able to get him the details of all that was going on. At the same time, the vice president then meets uh, with uh, President Zelensky September the 1st, as I'd mentioned before. That meeting happens September the 1st. And then Rob Portman, who's actually a senator, but he's the head of the Ukraine caucus. He also meets with the vice president and the president. Uh, September the 10th, I believe, was the date on that one. They all talk together. He's got the report from his cabinet officials. He's got the report from overseas. He's got the vice president reporting to him saying, this is what Zelensky has said to me in our meetings last week. And he's got Rob Portman talking through all the details in the Ukraine perspective. The president makes the decision, release the hold on it. They've made enough progress in those areas and they release the hold the very next day. So it was interesting to get the backstory on why it was held, what happened, what was the testimony, including testimony of the house had already happened in the house, but the house managers skipped and didn't talk about last week on it they gave kind of the rest of the story on it, which I, I thought was an interesting piece there. They spent a lot of time talking about Rudy Giuliani, and so the house manager spent a lot of time calling Rudy Giuliani, they call Rudy Giuliani the shiny object to say, look over here, uh, there's all this going on with Rudy Giuliani, but they also brought in something that the house managers didn't bring in, that's Rudy Giuliani started his work in Ukraine on behalf of the president in November of 2018. Uh, and it was a part of the Mueller investigation to gather more information based on the Mueller investigation that had been left out by the House managers. They were saying hey, they were, he was sent over just because of Vice President uh, Biden now saying he's running for, for um, president. He's saying that actually he had been there months and months and months before the vice president had ever announced, and he's working on the Mueller investigation issues. And there's a bunch more they went through there. Uh, there, there was also, they spent more time talking about this whole due process issue with the House because the House said, we gave you the opportunity to be able to turn things over. We gave you due process. The White House came back and said, let me describe the due process we were given. We were told if you wanted to be able to cross-examine, if you wanted to be able to have due process, if you want to be able to participate in the two judiciary hearings, and there were only two, the one with all the, the uh, law professors, and then the second one where they were just interviewing staff uh, that were a part of the uh, Intel Committee work. Uh, when they had that, they said, if you want to participate in one of those two, you have to surrender your rights on all subpoenas and on all documents. Give up your right to be able to court. If you give up your rights to go to court, then you can come be here and get due process with us to be able to be a part of cross-examinations. The White House said, clearly, we're not going to do that. We're not going to surrender all of our rights to be able to come. In fact, that's an unconstitutional request even. You can't surrender one constitutional right to get a different constitutional right given to you. You have both of those all the time. So they made that argument. They spent about two hours talking about Hunter Biden and about the Vice President Biden and all that was happening in Ukraine, how the Vice President of the United States, uh, Vice President Biden, started in Ukraine uh, doing anti-corruption work and being the official designee for the United States. He did 12 different trips uh, to Ukraine, meeting with all kinds of different officials there. And they detailed out how um, the vice president started doing all these trips. But two months after the vice president went to Ukraine, Burisma, this natural gas company that was one of the big players in energy and very corrupt, owned by an oligarch that eventually got kicked out of the country within just a few months after that uh, and was living abroad but still managing the company, that a few months after the vice president, Biden, was uh, asked to be able to be the point person for Ukraine and started going there to work on corruption. Burisma hires Hunter Biden and another friend of his to both be on this board in their investment group. Though they had no background in Ukraine, they had no background in natural gas, they had no background in any of these areas. They have a reach out from Burisma saying, we want to hire you. They came on, on staff with Burisma. They had to attend two board meetings a year and then they had a couple of trips into Europe that they had a responsibility for. But apparently that's all the responsibility they had was to attend two board meetings a year and then to make some appearances in Europe on behalf of Burisma. And for that, they were each paid $83,000 a month, $83,000 a month. And they had 17 months that they were employed to be able to be there. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty stark issue. And they kind of walk through the timeline of how all of this happened and then some of the things the vice president was doing, some of the things that were having state departments and emails that came to the state department where some other folks were emailing in and saying, hey, I've got concerns about this. 
but nothing was done at it. So they spent a big chunk of time talking through that. Uh, then there was a lot of transition to be able to talk about some of the bigger constitutional issues. Had two constitutional scholars that kind of walked through it. The last one of those being Alan Dershowitz, who's a Harvard professor. Uh, Alan Dershowitz is interesting, has actually testified and been a part of the Nixon impeachment uh, time period, the Bill Clinton time period, and now the Trump one. So it's very interesting that he's had this longevity of being at Harvard University for 50 years as a, as a law professor. And he just unpacked the history of impeachment, what is impeachable and what's not impeachable. And he was pretty stark on it, talking about here's the high standard that the founders put for impeachment. It was high crimes and misdemeanors. It was treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors. It had to be a crime was his first thing. And his challenge was the two things that the House has brought are things that he calls dishonesty or an accusation of abuse of power, which he said is like a political accusation. You would make in a campaign, you would say that person's abusing his power, but it's not a crime in the sense there is no statute that deals with that. So he said, this is the first time that we have a presidential impeachment and there's no crime that's actually being accused on it that's on the books. And so he spent a lot of time walking through the history of that. And he said, this whole issue of abuse of power, he went through a long list of presidents that were accused while they were president of abusing their power, starting with George Washington in the very first Congress, accused him of abusing his power at one point. They had a big fight back and forth, but he literally walked through about 15 different presidents. All, none of them had been impeached, but all of them had an accusation from Congress that they were abusing their power. And he said, it's a completely subjective thing. Uh, he did a quote from Maxine Waters, uh, who Maxine Waters apparently said at one point, impeachment is what Congress says it is, there is no law. He said that opinion is basically saying the legislative branch is above the Constitution. He's saying the legislative branch has to function under the Constitution. We all function under the law and that impeachment has a very high standard. It has to be a high crime uh, or this what we call misdemeanor is a low crime. He went back to what they had the definition at that time in the 1700s of what it was. And it was a crime uh, that was being occurred. And so he he walked through a ton of that kind of information, just trying to be able to evaluate what's happening, what's not happening. And he said at that time, there was great debate among the uh, founding fathers on something called maladministration, whether that should be in the list of treason, bribery, high crimes, misdemeanors, maladministration. And they determined at that time, they specifically rejected that. And he started walking through what maladministration means. He said, this is more akin to what President Trump is being accused of now, maladministration. And he said, the founders specifically rejected that. And so for the House to be able to send it over and say, we're going to impeach you for it anyway, when the Constitution specifically rejected that as a reason for impeachment, he said, is not consistent with the constitutional law. Uh, he also made an interesting comment. He said dishonesty is really what they're being, uh, what he's being accused of. And he said dishonesty is a sin, not a crime. And he said, you don't impeach someone for dishonesty. He said, quite frankly, uh, he said that uh, impeachment is not something about sinful behavior. It's about violation of a crime. Or otherwise, no president would ever finish out their term. Uh, and he spent a lot of time with that. He was very long. Alan Dershowitz is really good to be able to walk through a lot of history. But if you want to be able to walk through the constitutional principles on it, it's about an hour and 15 minutes to walk through that. And then there was a final statement that came up from Pat Cipollone where he spent some time talking through, you know, here, here's the recap a little bit of the day and what he heard from it. Uh, but he talked about, went back to what Ken Starr had said, that we're in the age of impeachment or the age of investigation, where for the past 40 years, every president has faced special counsels, bigger investigations. And he, he talked about how this is growing as a culture in our government and culture as a nation to have this age of impeachments and this age of investigations. And it's become more and more toxic for every president in the future. And his basic question was, how does this stop? Where does this go? And how do we resolve this as a country? And he challenged everyone with a ba very basic thing. He said, how do we do a golden rule of impeachments? The do unto others as they would have you do unto you. How do we get back to that uh, to be able to resolve this as we did in the past? So very interesting day. You can track through a lot of it. There's uh, constitutional arguments, law arguments, fact-based arguments, different pieces through the course of the day. The uh, uh, White House counsel will be back again tomorrow for their third and final day for the arguments. Then after that, there'll be two days of questioning where senators can ask any question that we want to ask. We'll have to be able to write those down and then submit those to the chief justice, and he'll start reading those, and he'll alternate a Republican, Democrat. I'll explain more of that tomorrow when we do the Facebook Live after the session tomorrow to be able to walk through with the question times, because that'll be really different than the previous six days have been in the past. There have been some questions today, and as well there should be. Last night, late, the New York Times released 
what they're summarizing is a John Bolton book that's a manuscript that they say there's someone in the White House that's going through the classification documents on of a manuscript that was turned over in late December that John Bolton has written a book. Now, apparently the New York Times folks have not read the book, but someone who has read the book is reporting to the New York Times they're remembering from what they're reading from the book and they're printing excerpts on it. It looks like they're gonna do a little bit of an excerpt every single day for this entire week, maybe for weeks and weeks. We, we have no idea that they're gonna try to pull some of the memory of this person that's read it, what they're remembering from the book and reporting to reporters and to be able to drop some of these things out. I, I, I think, getting that information firsthand would be really important for us. If John Bolton is no shrinking violet, uh, he is a very bold, outspoken individual uh, that I've never seen him. I've known him for a, a while since I've been in Congress. I've never seen him be shy about anything ever. So my encouragement would be if John Bolton's got something to say, there's plenty of microphones all over the country that he should step forward and start talking about it right now. In the meantime, we should get access, I believe, even though it's going through the classification document, every member of Congress has classified uh, clearance, we should be able to get access to that document to be able to read that manuscript for ourselves rather than get a third hand from the New York Times and what they're reporting, what someone else read, what they were saying and what they remember. We should be able to read that manuscript even before the classification is done on it so that we understand what's in that and to be able to hear firsthand uh, from that information. Uh, that's a minimum amount that we should actually be able to get. And I'm encouraging the White House and anybody that I can talk to to say that manuscript is pertinent and uh, we should be able to get access to the manuscript to be able to see what they're actually saying. And I'd encourage John Bolton, if he's got something to say, start saying it now. And uh, so we'll know the relevance of that. We still have quite a few days before we have to decide on witnesses and about testimony. There'll be more that'll continue to be able to come out to be able to make that decision. As I've said all along, the decision about witnesses and additional testimony, additional evidence that comes at the end of the trial. If all the questions are answered, we don't need it. If the questions are not answered, then we may. Uh, so we'll walk through this process and be able to get to a decision uh, at the end of that. But we need to be able to get that basic information to be able to go through the process. We'll give you more details tomorrow as we go through uh, the next phases of this. But tomorrow, again, is the last day for the White House to be able to make their case and to be able to walk through all the evidence and the details that they have. And then at that point, so at some point, I don't know how long they'll go tomorrow, they'll rest and end that, and then we'll move into the question phase uh, starting the very next day. If there's any way that we can help you in the journey to get more details or information to you, we're trying to post as much as we can on our website, langford.senate.gov. We post as many of the documents and details as we can on that site, and so you can get direct access to those if you're wondering where to be able to get it. Langford.senate.gov will have it in all likelihood in our current, uh, current issues section. Uh, you can send us uh, information, questions, thoughts, at, at Senator Langford at any of the social media platforms. At our website's also got the contact number for our phone numbers. Plenty of folks have found our phone numbers and have reached out to us uh, to be able to contact us with their thoughts and questions as well, uh, which you're welcome to be able to do. Uh, thanks for staying engaged. We'll try to be able to continue to keep you informed in every way that we can through the process. Not everybody has the ability to be able to watch the entire day, so I'm just trying to give a recap each day of what I saw during the course of the day, but I encourage as many folks as can and have time to be able to follow along on their own. It's important that Americans are getting an unfiltered look at what's actually happening so they can see it as much as they possibly can. So God bless. Thanks. We'll uh, touch base with you again tomorrow.